all right, we're ready to go. That actually is me. Not that one, that one, okay? And hopefully I'm not feeling like this by the end. Right, so let's move on. Um, what struck me, and certainly my, I feel a bit like the shop boy here because it's a 20% position, so I feel like I'm coming in for a Saturday post here. And I've got my other day job at my other institute, so I'm going to try and merge these today. Um, it's not going to be much zombies in this, but certainly we could be looking at apocalyptic conditions. And I'm going to go through this, give you the scenario. What happens if we don't have fossil fuels? Can we actually carry on? Can we generate our food, drink, and drugs? And I'm sure it wasn't the zombies that attracted people to the top. It's anything that's got drugs in the title and food and drink, people will invariably come along. And given that, can we think differently and adopt a sustainable approach to life? So, just some background material. You'll have read populist magazines, TV, BBC, what have you. The population's going up, and we're going to be close to 10 billion by 2050. Now, that's, that's the midterm scenario. It could go, look a lot worse, or we could be looking at some sort of either interventions or real problems causing uh, a downward spiral there, but not enough. What that brings up is some interesting things. So if you look at the country list and the populations now compared to what they might be in 2050, there's going to be a flip between India and China. India only has a third of the land mass that China has. They're looking at serious problems looking forward just to generate food, energy, security, and clean water. So, we've got academics in the room. If you want to work with a country for funding who's going to get funding thrown at them and they're really going to need it, it's going to be India. They've got some serious problems. And also, look at that. By 2050, Nigeria and the United States are going to have the same population, roughly. This really changes your mind, particularly if you're a young researcher and will actually be there at that point and working at that end, the countries you want to be starting to work with. So, what about our fossil fuels? Well, I think, and there's probably, I don't know if there's any fossil fuel people in the audience, but the term's called peak oil, where we've reached the point now where we're consuming more than we're producing, essentially. Um, and this was actually presented by a guy called M. King Hubert, probably one of the best names I've ever seen written down. You're a cool looking dude, he would pass as a hipster these days, so that haircut and a nice jacket. But he came up with this in the 70s. So we're looking at serious problems. So production rates are going down. I mean, they'll always find new oil fields, but we're on one earth, it is finite, end of. So we need to ad adopt a, a different approach to this. And probably as a result of this huge industrialization, huge amounts of uh, greenhouse gases being produced, we're hitting some really problematic events. You might remember 2015 in Cumbria, that great picture in the BBC with the caravan bobbing along down. I mean, that was an extreme flood event, which was definitely not expected. That was completely unusual. But these are happening more and more. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I've got some mates on that, essentially, they gave me the naughty version of this, otherwise it's a 200-page tome. That's our old climate, and that's what the new climate's going to look, at, look like. It's going to be less cold. That sounds fantastic. There's going to be more record hot. For Scotland, that usually means about 13, 14 degrees, I would think. Um, but what we're going to get in the middle is summer's actually not going to be that much better. It's going to be maybe a wee bit warmer. Winter's definitely going to be warmer, generally, although it doesn't feel like it today. But it's going to be a lot damper, and we're going to get more extreme events. So we're looking at some severe problems. So let's go back to the traditional ways of approaching how we produce food and drink and drugs. The traditional one, and I'm allowed to go through this one because I started off as a drug designer. In classical pharma, started off as a, an organic synthetic chemist, went in and was designing drugs for Fison's Pharmaceuticals. So if all this goes wrong, breaking bad is my pension at the end of this. <laughs> Seriously, it's very easy to do, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, so the interesting bit, and sorry it's a bit fuzzy, it says the research team form, uh, formed an objective set. Sounds very simple. Then you look at novel chemicals synthesized. Novel chemicals synthesized based on fossil fuel monomers. And as you get through all that chain, they're then produced using fossil fuel monomer systems. There's no sustainability in the traditional system, really. What then followed on from that in the, towards really the end of the 80s, uh, in the 90s and then the noughties, was a thing called combinatorial chemist, uh, chemistry. Have we got any chemists in the audience that have gone through this? Would anyone own up to have gone through this? Roger, you've gone up. You're a brave man. 
basically, instead of the A plus B gives AB, there was lots of different types of A and lots of different types of B, and you multiply across them and then screen the products that came out. Generally, I think you can call it a crashing failure. It didn't really produce anything for pharma. But pharma, so what pharma tend to go, has tended to do is go back to natural products. Well, what are they? Well, we've got a long history. I mean, you've got the, the Chinese folk medicine. You've, got, you've actually got um, Scottish folk medicine. There, are, there actually is a tome. And if you look at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh, they've got one there where they've used natural flora and fauna from Scotland to produce medicine. Every country's got one. But behind it, uh, what happened certainly in the Enlightenment, there was the development in chemistry. And they what they tried to do was try and tease out the structures uh, or the active components behind these mythical extracts and find out what they were. And from this, essentially, what developed was chemistry, organic and inorganic chemistry, with Berzelius in around about 1800s. And this really kicked things off. So I'll give you a few examples of some interesting ones. Um, so we first isolated pure morphine in about the 1800s. It was used way before that. But as a pure compound, it came about then. Uh, and it's a fairly complex one. You've got things like strychnine and quinine. Quinine, of course, was initially used, uh, well, they used it in the Raj. They used to put it in the tonic to take with gin and tonics. And because quinine wards against or prevents against malaria, which is a much more sensible way to take your drugs, I would think. And there's a whole range of these things. You've got camphor, which you usually, these days, is essentially used as a smell, but it's actually got bioactive components in it. Cocaine, hopefully none of you have any experience in this system at all. I'll come back to this later, but interestingly, that chemical structure there is very common in potatoes. If you look at, and we do a lot of work, I do a lot of work on potatoes in my other job, and if you look at potato waste, we can extract components that have that basal structure in it. Now, whether that makes potatoes addictive, difference, I'm not quite sure. Obviously, it is for me. I mean, <laughs> I thought I'd say it before you did. Right, so as, as the years go on and chemistry starts to pick up, much more significantly, you start to see the complexity of the molecules we can isolate and test against become increasingly complex. Now, combinatorial chemistry, to produce something like that, your A by B matrix would be huge. It would be A by B, and then you'd have to take one of them and create another matrix with the combinatorial ones again and again. It just doesn't happen. But nature is phenomenally bountiful with regard to this. And similarly, if you then go to the marine side, which actually the marine side has never been particularly well explored. There's some great chemists working in this area in Scotland, Marcel Jaspers in Aberdeen, for example. Does some phenomenal work pulling out these wonderful uh, components. Although this one's a toxin, it could be a basal component for designing new drugs on. Um, and then, of course, anyone who's had the unfortunate problem of having cancer, particularly breast cancer, would probably have taken this one under the form um, paclitaxel. Uh, again, Incredibly complex molecule. These are the type of things I remember when I, after my degree, I went to industry. I decided I had enough of academia. I've turned the corner, guys. You're okay. Come back to it. I wanted money, so I went into the pharma industry. But I remember the students used to come in to the pharma industry, and they'd spend three years, and that would be their end point, just a total synthesis of these things. And it wouldn't be uncommon for someone just about to submit it and someone else publishes. The heartbreak of that has to be seen to be believed. Anyway, I digress. And of course, you've got the ones that you take in dietary, absinthe. Again, the complexity of these molecules are just phenomenal. To try and make them synthetically is just heartbreakingly difficult. And even if you've got yields at each step of 90-odd percent, once you start to add these together, the yield from start to finish is vanishingly small. You scale that up to an industrial level, it's a costly process. OK, so even the things we eat and drink, um, they're all packed full of natural products. So you've got allicin and garlic, which breaks down, gives you that characteristic aroma and feeling. Some of the things you don't eat, obviously, are extracted from, it's either willow or birch bark, I can never remember which one it is. Um, salicylic acetate, essentially that's aspirin. That's probably one of the very early natural products that people took. It's willow. It's willow, that's what it was, thank you. Was that known or did you have a quick Google? <laughs> <laughs> Well done. Interestingly, this is the one, this is heroin. Now, in the 1920s, a thing called the binge, now, I could, I mean, we have maybe some people that are slightly older than me here, but I doubt if you're even that far back. That was actually quite freely available, and it was also often given to our boys at the front during the First World War. 
I think, given the First World War, I'd probably want that. Um, and so another thing, green tea, you've got some really complex components. Again, very, if you look at that, um, cocaine-like, if you remember the structure. So there's, cranberries contain something called procyanidins. Now, these are uh, polyphenolic molecules, and they're pretty flat. And what they do is they stop bacteria adhering to the lining of your um, um, urinary tract, in women particularly, and it stops cystitis. Then you've got the colored components in uh, soft fruit, and you've got the compounds that do the business in rhubarb. And most of these will actually survive cooking, the dietary ones, so that's where it becomes important. Now, I'm going to ask you to guess what this is. This is just a simple product. It's got all this chemistry in it with all these potential activities because of the compounds. Crucially, though, it contains ethanol. Anyone want to have a punt? Tell me what's behind that window. It's alcohol-based. Come on, give us a guess. Wine? Red wine? Nope. Next. A bit more complex than that. Absolutely. Nope. Well done, that man. <laughs> There's a man to be watched, obviously, <laughs> especially during the day. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, isn't that vastly amazing? The amount of chemistry just in something that's generally taken to get you completely out of your box, I think, if you go into any student union. All right, so that, compare that with the traditional approach, it just doesn't work. So then there's a phenomenal paper by a guy called Dave Newman, and what he did was he looked back at all the approved drugs to see, well, which ones were actually purely synthetic and which ones were natural. Sorry about the complexity of this, but I've used it for lecturing and other ones and I thought it was good. The main thing is, this block out of all the drugs are pure synthetics. All of these are based on natural products. So, you've only got roughly 30-ish percent are based on synthetics. Uh, goes the end. And again, if you do it year by year, now where's the colour? The synthetic is that one, the green. If you go back, there was loads of them and you start to see it die away. Industry is going back to natural products. We're going back to the things we can essentially grow, whether it's from animals, plants, bacteria, sponges, mollusks, any of them. And we could cut and slice that different ways. You can go down to small molecules. It's slightly bigger for the synthetics there, but again, the majority is still natural products. And again, you start to get the same thing. And this time, the synthetics, the blue, it's diminishing, falling again. We're going back to natural product chemistry which is someone who was brought up in natural product chemistry, is fine by me. I'll skip this one. Cancer drugs, much the same again. You're getting a huge number of natural product ones. Um, interestingly, if you look at the, the FDA approval ones, if you widen the definition of natural products, keep it natural, you're starting to see things coming in like full, full systems, polyclonal antibodies, a seriously big molecule, to be honest peptides, proteins, and carbohydrates coming in. And they're becoming very dominant because of this, they've got such a complex 3D structure, they're fitting receptors, and you're hitting them properly. Now, if you go back to where my heart lies, it's plants. Uh, the chemistry in, for these types of diseases, infectious diseases, pain, neuralgia, cardiovascular, this is just a, a handful of them. But if you concentrate down on something very, very specific, cancer, there's so many, but generally as a process, there's lots of different chemistries involved in this. I think the estimation for plant diversity and uh, phytochemical diversity in plants is about 200,000. I think that's pretty conservative. I reckon it's up to about 300,000 distinct compounds. So we've got, and that's the only ones that are occurring naturally. You can then take them and build on them. You can add fluorines and bromines and what have you. So there's a whole world to be played with there. Excuse me. Right, so let's go back to the plants. How do we exploit the plants? Right, so at my other institute, we do a lot on potato, and we host what's called the Commonwealth Potato Collection, which is a wide-ranging collection of wild potato material. Now, these are all potatoes, before the bean, just in case anyone's querying that. So there's a huge, wide range of structures, tuber types. Many of these, if you were to eat them, would be incredibly toxic. That's fine, that's a jukebox tick for me. Toxicity means there's interesting chemistries in there. So we, we went through recently, and we're going through it again, all the accessions. We take a classical approach. You make your extract, you put them on a column, you loot them with solvents, and, and you either start off with um, water going through to ultimately ether or vice versa. 
and then you test them against a different set of screens, whether it's bacterial, cancer ones, or a whole range of other ones you would want to look at. Essentially to nail down, narrow down the range of what the, what the molecules that are bioactive are. Um, right. So, we started off with 200, two, uh, 2,058 specific potato lines, accessions, wild accessions, and we got four hits. That's pretty good. If it was combinatorial chemistry, I reckon you'd be starting off with 50,000, 100,000 to get four out of that, and even then you'd be lucky. So we're then following these through. But the advantage is, if those hits work, we can just grow the plant again and re-extract it. We don't have to go through the whole synthesis step. You just take the seed, you put it back in, and you grow it again. How simple is that? That's sustainability writ large, I think. So, let's go into food then. So food security has been at the forefront of many agendas. Um, food goes hand in hand with things like economic stability and growth. You grow food because it has to be sold, that people have to eat it, so that, that it's a complex system. But health by dietary means is becoming very important, but also a huge business. But really, well, does it really matter to you? Okay, so here we have the crawl of obesity, or the levels of obesity in the States, going from, I can't remember what it started there, 1980s, 1990, up to 2006, I think it is. Now, as it gets more orange, the chubbiness of America goes up. I would imagine the average level of America is probably going down. We can be very smug about this, but this is happening here. You look at some place, as I mentioned, India before, and places where they're starting to get a bit of cash, and they're starting to get the, the westernized diet, the eastern rim of China is particularly bad for this at the moment. Their obesity levels are just going through the roof. They're adopting a stylized and aspirational diet, which is McDonald's fries, steak, sugary foods. And this is the consequence. But what comes with that is huge amounts of disease costs, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, certain cancers, colon cancer in, in particular. And the health costs associated with these just are just catastrophic. So, heart disease. Again, the original one came from a natural product, this time from a mold, a penicillium mold, statins. And from that, from that parent statin, lots of other statins have been developed. So in the UK, one in 14 people are on statins. Scotland could go one better, though it's one in seven. <laughs> a bit depressing, really, isn't it? I'm not going to go, yeah, it's just absolutely depressing, that one. It was one in seven this morning. It's probably one in six and a half now. Um, so the costs associated with, I'm not going to go through that, you can have a look at that yourself. The costs of treating people on this are huge. Um, so that's, what that does is stop cholesterol synthesis in the body. There's a dietary means that is slightly different and a lot cheaper, costs the NHS nothing. nothing. Take Benicol. What Benicol does is it uses plant stanols, a different chemistry, and it's a component from pine bark. It was found from the pulping industry. They thought, what the hell are we going to do with all this pine bark? We've pulped the trees, but we've got all this stuff left. Right, you chemists, make something of this. And they developed this component called stanols. The animal tested and found this competes with cholesterol uptake in the body. And it doesn't do anything itself. It's benign. So this is why uh, the margarine sells through the roof. And it makes a serious impact on your cholesterol reabsorption. Um, so I think they'd rather people came off of this and went on and paid for it themselves through dietary means. Um, Scotland produces a lot of good produce, um, some really good natural produce, yet we are a nation of poor health. I mean, I think our mortality is going down, but our morbidity, we're living longer but not particularly well, is going up. Um, and I do tend to get a bit sick fed up of seeing adverts for this lovely produce, and it's always shortbread or it's always chocolate and things like that. We've got phenomenal fruit, veg, meat produce, and if, Phenomenal other things beyond that. Of course, if I'm, if I'm speaking to Scotland Food and Drink, that message will be completely different. You can be assured. Um, but soft fruit is something we produce extremely well, across certainly the middle belt. In these, again, these are small bags of phenomenal chemistry, and they've got some really interesting uh, components in there. And in almost every type of model, cell, um, tissue, animals and humans, you, get, you generally get a positive result against almost all of these, all of these degenerative conditions. Of course, if you're eating them, it's got to survive uh, a, a fairly vigorous bioreactor. So it's going into the mouth at pH 7.5, something like that. 
goes down to the stomach, which is one and a half to three and a half, and then back up again to alkaline systems. So the body's giving it a sort of Guantanamo Bay feeling. It's giving it a bit of a waterboarding as it's going through. So it's knocking hell out of it. And so these components will fall apart. So the bioactivity in a lot of the cases might not rest with the parent molecule, but either the digestion products, or if it goes down to the liver, where it adds X, Y, and Z onto it, the metabolites. So that means attributing bioactivity to the original food becomes very difficult. And if you're a plant breeder, it becomes a real pain in the ass because you can't necessarily argue that this is what's giving the activity. However, what we do, or what we have done, is look at, we actually digest some of the extracts and then put them into cell systems, animal systems. And so, for example, if you pre-incubate colon cells with, say, a raspberry extract that's been pre-digested and then give it an oxidative stress challenge, hydrogen peroxide is a standard one. It's a bit crass, but it's effective. The more you pre-incubate it with the cells, with the extract, the less of a DNA damage trail you get. It's a bit empirical. It's a bit on the nose. But it's a bit bloody impressive as well. It works. And we've actually done it in tissues, and it works. Also, what we found is, same sort of experiment, invasiveness goes down as well. So, what does it mean? It means eat bloody soft fruit in any format you can. Drinks, full fruit, take it in. There's no bad stories. We actually did studies, proper studies with people, and we do that very often with different collaborators around the world. And I love the term here. This is one of my colleague's slides. 10 free living students. So that, that really doesn't bear examination, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Might be back to the Jaeger bombs again, I think, Peter. Um, so we, we gave, gave them these samples, and, and we were brave enough to actually sample, made them collect urine and feces to find out what happened. What, well, we know what happened. It wasn't a nice story. We, we analyzed these to find out where these active components were going to. And generally, a lot of the, the anthocyanins, the colored components, all got broken down to this. But they varied as to which ones, and there was many more than these, were in which person. So each person actually responded differently. So is it the digestion system that's doing that? Is it a genetic base? By and large, not. It tends to be good down when it hits the colon. And the variations in their bacterial systems really start to come into play there. So this, and you'll actually see this. Anyone who's works in any part of biology at the moment will find the microbiome research area is just extremely hot for that exact reason, because a lot of the health, if you play around with people's health, you can, if you manipulate the microbiome, you can have huge impacts on people's general health and long-term um, health as well. Okay, right, let's flip away from that end to the other end of the body, the brain. <clears throat> this came about like everything else, having a glass of wine at the end of a conference with someone, it was a brain surgeon. <laughs> Often you can say that. Sounds like a start of a joke, doesn't it? I walked into a bar. He was a brain surgeon. <laughs> I chatted to him and told him what I was working on. He said, oh, we'd love to try it. He works on brain tumours. And when you're taking a brain tumour out, you take out, you've got to take out some clean stuff because you don't want to leave any uh, brain cancer still in there. So because you've got clean stuff, you've got arterial tissue there that's non-cancerous. So if you take that out, you've got a system you can test components against for brain systems. And you can look at flow. So basically, a lot of the things associated with stress, and if you're working on a PC a long time, a lot of it can be associated with um, blood pressure in the brain, that type of stress. What we found was, if we incubated healthy brain tissue with these black, digested black current components, and we know they get into the brain in every animal system except the human, because they don't particularly like getting bits of brain taken out. Um, for an equal flow rate, you get a reduced tension. Okay, basically, you get a reduced pressure. If you're consuming these, your, art your arteries just tend to relax. An interesting non-brain comparison of that is, um, there was a study done in Japan, I think it was in the 1950s, and I've been desperately trying to get someone to refund it again here. If you go to the Middle East, particularly in places like Persia, it wasn't Persia, no, Iraq, Iran, these type of places, and also in Japan, a lot of the women get the dark circles under the eyes, okay? particularly when tired and run down. What's happened there is the microvascular is just shut down. You're not getting a good enough blood flow. You give them a drink of black currant and these things just disappear. The panda eyes go. That's what they call it, the panda eye syndrome. And it disappears. But your body then metabolizes this out and it comes back again. To me, for a product, that's quids in because someone's got to continually drink this product again and again and again. I mean, it sounds like a trivial thing, but certainly for appearance-wise, it can be devastating for some, some people if they've continually got this. 
But what it's doing is exactly the same thing as that. It's allowing these micro arteries to expand and relax. We've done full intervention trials before with fruit. So as I say, why take drugs when you can actually take the fruit instead? And through a whole series of crossover type of ones with black currants and blueberries. If you take, but blueberries, by the way, have almost no vitamin C in them. They're not nearly as healthy as black currants. If you're going to eat anything, go for the black currants. That's my sales pitch on my colleagues' work over and done with, and we'll move on now. Um, however, if you take either of them, the blueberry group showed, and this is a hard one to do, they showed a reduction in the thickening of the arteries. Everyone's arteries th thicken. It's very hard to get them to unthicken. But what the blueberry intake groups showed was that the rate of this thickening was actually a lot slower. That's good. That's fine. That's what you want. The black currant group showed something similar. Not as good. But what it showed was a reduction in isoprostates. Excuse me. And these are markers of um, oxidative stress and inflammation. So it's double bubble. You're getting a win. Just take the fruit in. It's going to help you. Um, the other study we did was looking at glucose and insulin management. And we wanted people to try blackcurrant drink and one that we've super loaded with these polyphenols to see if it made a difference. Now, that's the drink they're taking in, that's the blood they're taking out. It came to me, I, I hadn't crossed my mind that people might think, so are they, inject, are they injecting the juice straight into their arms there? It looks very similar to that. <laughs> Maybe in Govan, perhaps, that might work, I don't know, although it would probably be Sunny D there to be honest, wouldn't it? Um, so anyway, so we did inter intervention trials, took the blood, what we found was after a couple of hours, the blood suddenly became really, po uh, is that the blood or the urines there? Anyway, both the blood and the urines became very populated by polyphenol chemistries. Then they got swept out, but then after a while, between four, six hours, six to eight hours, they started, some of them started to come in again. And these are the ones that actually didn't get taken up in the digestive system. They went down to the colon, the bacteria broke them apart, and then they were reabsorbed. So you're getting a double hit. You're not missing anything. Importantly, what we found was when they took the juice in, particularly the enhanced juice, which is the one in the, in the, the hard dots, the amount of gl uh, glucose that went into the body from the juice was pretty much the same, as was the insulin that was released. But the ones with that higher polyphenolic load from the extra black current didn't go for the boom and burst, which means the higher amount of fruit bioactive stopped that sugar rush you got, and then it stopped the insulin uh, secretion that tends to deal with the sugar rush. The problem with the sugar rush is, if that happens continually, you get a lot of oxidative stress in your arteries, leads to cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, da da da, da ultimately death. Similarly, the big boom and burst in insulin leads to insulin intolerance and diabetes. So, if I was selling this, if you're having McDonald's, have a fruit juice after it. Don't have the Coke, of the fruit juice. It will modulate the sugar a wee bit. It depends on many fries you're eating, of course, compared to the amount of juice. But as a way forward, get the soft fruits into the diet. Another argument for getting the soft fruits into the diet is some very simple stuff we did with, uh, this was actually just an undergraduate student. We got them to isolate anthocyanins and allagitanins from raspberry. Anthocyanins are the color components. Allagitanins are the things in raspberries. When you bite raspberries, your mouth goes like that. The tartness, the dryness, that's what causes them. And we tested them against a whole range of different enzymes involved in the body's digestive processes. It's essentially, the anthocyanin stopped amylase, which is a starch digesting enzyme, stone dead. Elagitanin stopped glucosidase, also one of the starch digesting enzymes, stone, stone dead. Amylase breaks starch down. Starch obviously is in your bread, in the, the bun, and in the fries. It's, it breaks starch down into larger molecules. Glucosidase nibbles the sugar off the end and releases sugar in. So taking in fruit juice with your burger and fries will stop the release of sugar. It's as simple as that. So you might have a guilty pleasure, but if you are going to do that, take the fruit juice in with it. Um, other work we've moved on to is looking at neurological disease. Alzheimer's is a big thing at the moment. Um, and we worked with mice that were, were wild-type mice, but also mice that had been predisposed to accelerate through the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And then what you do is you put them through a thing called the Morris Swim Navigation Test. Basically, it's to find out how, how they can think. And you do it repeatedly. So it's one, two, time and time and time again. And this can go on for many repetitions. And you're looking at the reduction in time 
it takes them to do this. And every time, the ones that are the wild type, they're the ones that haven't got Alzheimer's, they perform the best, so they work the fastest. The ones with Alzheimer's are always the worst. But if you put the black current components into their chow, they will, you start to pull this effect back. So it's having some sort of impact on this. I'm not going to put any functionality on this. Basically, they operate not like the wild type, but they're nothing like the ones that have the comparative Alzheimer's things in there. I mean, that type of message, if you have anyone in your family that has anything going towards that, get fruit in their diet. It's not going to harm them. At the very least, they're going to have a nice juice. But there could be some benefits in there. Ideally, we would like to extend this to pre-Alzheimer's people to see if it, how it works. Put them on a long-term dose of specific fruit juice intakes and get them to do cognitive studies and see if it actually retards progression of the disease. That's quite an interesting one. Okay. So how do we sustainably produce, which I've shown in, in the food, we can sustainably produce these. So let's go back and compare. What's the advantage of the biologics? Now, we have some chemists in the audience, and hopefully some of them have done fundamental chemistry, some basic chemistry. You've got the combinatorial libraries across A with B with C with D. They produce, you'll get a certain level of chiral center. So basically, if you're looking at a carbon molecule, it's got four bonds. You've got three bonds this way and one that way. Uh, the chiral centers mean it's a specific stereochemistry. So if you pulled its mirror image out, you couldn't overlap them. One, one would be pointing the wrong way. Okay? And this is very important for drug trials. The best example of this one is probably thalidomide. Thalidomide was produced in two optical isomers. Okay? One of them was a fantastic drug. The other one was an absolute disaster and caused the thalidomide problem. Which is a pity because... Uh, the drug, if they'd isolated the correct one, would have solved the problems it was set out to do. So, but then that goes back to the whole thing about receptors. This is where, if you go to natural products, and you'll see, if you go through the FDA-approved drugs, as I said before, there was lots of natural products, to truly naturally derived molecules, the chiral centers, the complexity just increases. But we are at the point now where we can actually start designing these in planta and changing them or in bacteria, or in yeast, or in anything we have the genome for. So you combine all these omics, and with bioinformatics across the top as the uh, data mining tool, if you, want to, if you want to describe it that way. I mean, sequencing these days is really facile. It's as cheap as chips, is the best way to describe it. And, and what, we then take, what we're trying to do now, and we're actually doing this in some EU projects, is you identify the biosynthetic pathway to a molecule, you get all the genes, and you can either ramp them up in plant, or whatever it is you're working in, modify them, so you're producing slightly different ones at the end, or actually, you know what? Plants are not the best thing for this. I'm gonna pick them up and drop them into bacteria or yeast. That game is happening now. That's what farmers into these days. I think if you look at GlaxoSmithKline in Scotland, it's predominantly industrial biotech. Am I right, Roger? Yeah. So they've seen where the direction of travel is. It's cheaper to do it that way. What's interesting about that then is, is Traditionally, a lot of our drug finds would have been from some group of people going into the Amazonian rainforest or some weird and wonderful place to collect a selection of plants. So they bring it back, fractionate and characterize, and put it through a whole range of testing systems, eventually into animal systems, and then in clinical trials. And if it all works, mark it. That's fine. The problem you've got now, it's not a problem, it's, it's, it's ethically, it's correct. You've got a thing called the Nagoya Protocol where if you're taking that from their country, you've got to pay them back and they're going to get paid back a share of that. And what that's done is put a real break on natural product mining. What they're doing now tends to be slightly different. I'm not sure it's ethically correct, but we'll get back to that. You can do all that on a research basis. You're not making money on it. But what it will do is identify your target. You then go back and sequence that. So you've got the genome of this one, and you compare it to the genomes of the plant's sister species in your own country. Now, you're allowed to freely exploit them. So if you then find the gene pathway for the, for the component you're looking for in a, a native species, you're free to operate. Ethically, it's a bit dodgy, because essentially you're taking that idea but exploiting it here. I've not seen anyone challenge that yet, but that's the route that's happening behind closed doors anyway. Um, so, in one an EU project we call DISCO, we are upregulating and playing with the chemistry in plants in potatoes, iridaceae, which is saffron, 
Um, we've got the biosynthetic pathway for saffron. We'll play around with that to create lots of different saffron molecules that are slightly different colored and bioactives. And in tomato, there's lots of different carotenoids that then, they themselves have different bioactivities. And using novel gene editing techniques, we're producing lots of different molecules in plant. So we can start to produce, and tomato is probably a good example, a 40 carbon molecule that would take you a significant amount of money to synthesize. Once we've produced the GM plant, or if you use new technologies, which are CRISPR technologies, they're not classed as GM, and you couldn't detect them from a mutant, you just grow them. You don't need the huge production facilities. You'll need it to extract it, but to synthesize it, all you need is John Innes compost, water, and a greenhouse. For capital investment, that sounds pretty good. The other one that I'm involved in as well is the one where we're looking at plant polyphenols. So we can't, very much the same thing. We characterize the pathways in fruit, but in this case, we want to take the gene pathways and drop them into bacteria. So can we get down to the point where we're producing single molecules? So one of the companies we work with, Christian Hansen, big fruit company uh, globally, they wanted uh, sustainable color, natural colorants to go into their foods, but they don't want to extract them from fruit because the combination year to year varies. They want a single source. So they're happy to take industrial biotech, but they want a single molecule. So they know every time they're getting it. They don't want a synthetic version, and, but they'll class industrial biotech as a natural one. And so that's one route we're going to follow from that. So it's, it's, is that natural or not? I'll let you argue that one yourself. And then when you're down to that system of GM and growing them, we're not, I'm now looking at, um, I've had a company spin into where I work and they're producing vertical farming, huge towers where we can completely and utterly control the environment, everything. Essentially, once you close that door, you don't need to go in again until the plants are ready to come out. It's under full camera control, it's under full PC control, and it operates everything. LED lighting, response back from the plant, so we're monitoring everything all the time. It's, it's a bit like, um, I was going to say soil ink green, but it's something different to that. It's what, like one of these early 70s films. That's exactly what it looks like. It's quite creepy, but phenomenally successful and working. Now, they're being, they were marketed originally for producing food. I think you're wasting your time and food on these. It's actually pharma crops you want to be growing. So we can grow pharma crops in... Shetland or Orkney are rural places where actually unemployment's not, uh, unemployment is high. You can actually ship high-tech industries into these places. You can grow them up there. Put the small extraction plants. So actually what they're then shipping over to pharma is uber-enriched extracts that can then be tested and scaled up. I'll skip through some of these due to time. Right, so let's look at sustainable chemicals. What time is it now anyway? Plenty left? Five, okay, I'll skim through fast. Um, the big problem is it's not just pharma that needs chemicals. Everything we're dealing with here deals with chemicals. Plastics are ubiquitous, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The big thing now, if you were to throw a stick at policy and chemistry at the moment, circular economy is what's going to come up. That's your big area. If you're dealing with resources of any shape or form at the moment, and your science in that area, consider it as a circular economy. And essentially what this is reusing, what was formerly termed a waste. Now the waste could be energy, heat, gas, chemicals, whatever. Just can it be reused? Interestingly, Scotland in, might even be Europe, I'm not sure globally, they're the only country that I can think of that actually has a strategy for circular economy. And they won an award recently at a governmental level for actually being so forward thinking with regard to proposing this as a model for a country to live by. So, we started off actually as a biofuels nation. Basically, we burnt the wood. Fair enough. But you can see as industrialization came in, coal, oil, and gas, we went gung ho for that. That one's obviously changing. Was it last weekend? Scotland was, no, UK was coal free, I think. And wind produced a third of Scotland's energy. Was that right this weekend? It's bloody cold anyway, I know that. So, there's no where the wind came from. So what does the sustainable systems have to compete against? Right, you've got the oil. It isn't going away. In fact, it's coming more to the fore with the result of things like fracking. And fracking essentially has killed the bioethanol industry. I've got friends in the States who were just on the cusp of getting this really commercialized. Fracking came out, and it was dead. But it's only dead for a time. 
you can only frack so much and then there's none left. The bioethanol thing will come back again. So the oil is cracked, to use their terminology, into small molecules, but the real value is in the cracker plus one, the, the adding the functionality on. And this then goes into things like plastics and almost anything. If you put your hand out and put your hand down on something, the cracker-based products will be in there. However, the chemistries that are coming up now mean you can take renewable resources and actually you don't need to do that one. It'll start producing these ones almost, dare I say it, single -ish step. Not in huge yield at the moment, but we're not going to be far from it. There's a lot of companies that are now coming up running around this. This was 2011, looking at fermentation, thermochemical and algae. I think if you did that now, you would have to have 50 or 60 slides. Huge number of companies are coming to this. Mainly small companies, but developing specific parts of the system that are then getting bought up by other companies. It's a big industry. There's lots of ways you can actually convert biomass as a renewable feedstock. There's the old way, old school, just burn it. We've got one that actually we have an institute based on it, converting starch to alcohol. You've got the ICDB here. And then there's loads of other ones. The Fisher Trops one's an interesting one, which is there's a company called Sasol that converts coal into carbon monoxide water and then converts that back into hydrocarbons. That's, that's a big area, and they were really interested in biomass. And again, it was like the bioethanol story. They were on the cusp of actually adopting this, and fracking came out, and that's killed that stone dead. But it'll come back. But probably more interesting is cracking it down using enzymes and acid, which is a bit more delicate. Acid hydrolysis never sounds delicate, but it is in this case. Um, I'll skip through. So what does a plant cell wall look like? Well, if, if you've got an atomic force microscope, that's what a, a plant cell wall looks like. You've got the cellulose in there, and around it, components of polyaromatic called lignin, and hemicellulose is a complex sugar that glues it all together. Now, essentially, they're made of the same thing. But that, that one's got a much thicker wall. It's about as simple as that, and a slightly different composition of these, these components. So biomass, biomass can easily be used to take through the ethanol. We know that. Most of us, I'm not even sure if there's going to be some of that later on. I'm not quite sure. But that's the usual weekend for most people, to be drinking the ethanol that was converted from biomass, often in far too large a quantity. Um, but then the ethanol itself can then be converted into these Cracker or Cracker One products. Um, but if you go to hydrolysis and then fermentation, it gives you a whole world of other things you can create, and they themselves then can go to wildly different chemistries. And they're really quite easily substituting for Cracker plus one, plus one, plus one. They're, they're further up the value chain, significantly further up the value chain. And actually, the chemistries to get there are not that difficult. They're quite crude, but what you get out of the end is actually incredibly valuable. Another nice one is you can convert cellulose or hemicellulose to glucose. An enzyme will then flip this to fructose, and that fructose can then produce some really interesting chemistries that can go through there. Basically, if you drew a line there, that's where the oil industry works. But it's this bit. This is sustainable bit. So what I'm suggesting is we need to be developing this that can fit into the existing infrastructures. I'm not telling them they should be creating new plants that are going to be very different. People ain't going to put their hand in their pocket and spend one billion on a new plant because your system is nice and sustainable. If your system fits into their system, different story. And there's lots of different angle, angles on this where you start to produce it and you can get into it. I mean, the thought of producing, converting cellulose into jet fuel is actually... I just find that quite exciting. If only you can get um, Richard Branson to put money into it. He just went straight into biodiesel, which is a bit less exciting. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, yeah, let's skip ahead to some other ones. So you can convert starch, as I say, into lactic acid. So you've got the, your uh, fermentation systems. And again, you're up into different ones. Actually, a different fuel this time. Butanol, which is probably a better fuel. Or you can go into... Different chemistries, so just by adding a couple of acids on it, completely expands what you can do with feedstocks like cereal straw. And there's, there's hundreds of examples of these. All right, let's go to plastics now. So, sorry about the fudginess of this. This is a, from a nominally a not for wide circulation document. It's for legislation of plastics that's going on in the EU at the moment. And one of my colleagues is in this, and he says, have a look at this, see what you think. 
So from 1960 to 2050, our plastics production is expected to go up by 80-fold. It's scary numbers. That's a serious amount of plastic getting produced. <laughs> now, by and large, a lot of it isn't being recyclable or degradable. So obviously, this turtle's been caught in a, um, a six-pack ring pool plastic when it was younger. And you can just see how it's inhibited the, the shell growth. That's appalling. And I'm not quite sure where it is in the Atlantic, but it's, it's not the biggest pseudo landmass that's floating about, this cycling vortex. It's predominantly just non-degradable plastic. This is appalling. We can't let this happen. And certainly, it isn't going to be allowed to happen. The plastic industry is changing significantly and looking for alternative feedstocks. Biomass is one of them, but recycling things like CO2. So trapping CO2 from industrial flumes, trapping it into and converting it into something uh, that's chemically-ish that can then go into plastics. Um, one of the places I know that's working is, I think it's in Iceland, where they trap CO2 and convert it into methanol. It's quite an easy one, but I say that. It's a royal we, it's easy for them. So you can convert cellulose into ethylene glycon. With a, this is a one step. Really nice catalyst, one step, 60, 75%, bang. Ethylene glycon then creates polyethylene tethalate, one of the biggest used plastics you've got. You've got complex molecules like lignin that is the third most common biomass in the world after cellulose and hemicellulose. Again, single step chemistries is cracking these down into fairly complex fine chemicals. So we're not having to go in baby steps anymore. The, the, the catalysis systems have run so far ahead, we can really just take really dirty chemistry and produce really fine chemicals at the end of it. So can we easily convert straw to glycol to PET? This might be a feedstock for Scotland. Scotland produces 1.7 million tons of straw a year. That's a lot of straw. That's a lot of feedstock. Can we use it sensibly? I think Roger Kilburn and I might be discussing about that later on. Um, so if you've got PET and recyclable PET, what can you do with it? Well, recycle 45 bottles and you can make one of these bub uh, baby strollers. 16 bottles, you've got a baby car carrier. 10 bottles and you've got a new pair of these really smart Adidas running shoes. All from recycled. And all of these would have come from biomass. I find that quite impressive, I don't know about you. Um, so, the message from that one is linearity in plastic is out. Taking the oil out, making the monomers, making the plastics, throw it away. Nah, it's not going to happen anymore. That game is way over. Well, it's way over in the people that can afford it. When you then go to the developing countries, <laughs> it's, it's harder to impose our thoughts onto their setup. So it, it needs to be a level of education. But circularity is certainly the way forward. Nearly the end. Some of the work that's been done recently and I helped with by Industrial Biotech and Zero Waste Scotland is to actually look at the, the waste generated at local authority level. If we've got so much waste, 1.7 million tonnes of straw, I think it was 3.7 million tonnes of animal manure and slurry. That's a lot of poop to be dealt with. So what can we do with it? If you look at that, it's actually packed with really interesting chemistries in there. Lots of fats, lots of different proteins. They're feedstocks that can be pulled out and used for something else. So essentially, you've got the industry wanting raw materials at one side. You've got waste at the other side. Surely we can put these together and even on just a national level, create something really spectacular in Scotland. It's going to be a flagship going forward to uh, create sustainable chemicals. To do that, for a lot of the things like straw, you need a biorefinery where you have to crack this down. But a lot of this cracking can just be done by machine. It's milling and water, water extractions. Um, and the cities want this. The cities are looking at this as exciting. So this is if you, I'm not quite sure what happens with these talks, but if people want this link, I would recommend this one. Glasgow City looked at the circularity of all their waste. What do they do with it? Or not just their waste, everything that comes out, but what goes in and what comes out. And they developed plans and scenarios as to how waste from one can go into another and into another and keep it going around. How many cycles can you get something going around? How many times can a carbon molecule be reused in a cycle before it's actually lost, for example, as CO2 and goes? So some of the examples they gave was waste from the brewing, like spent grains. I mean, these are really low-tech but workable ones. They can go straight, you can dry them, shred them up and put them into bread. You've increased the fiber capacity of bread like that. There's not much of a taste impact. Alternatively, you can use them as 
um, composting materials for mushrooms. The other way you can do it is there's a lot of waste bread. Bread's full of starch. Starch can be converted to sugar or as a feedstock for yeast. And you, now people are commercially producing beer from bread. But there's a lovely circularity in that. It's a sort of yin and yang type of approach. Right, let's get to the next one. Other stuff I've done with wheat bran is if you want to machine mill it down even further, you can take bran and convert it to two different soluble, insoluble fractions, and then subfractionate down. This is just water in machines, millings. So you can then produce protein fractions, prebiotics, um, oils, and actually oils that are going to go into really high-end cosmetics. So your price per gram of that, if, if you're able to mill all that out, that will pay for all of that other system there because of the component it's going into. Scary. And it works. We've tried this out on smaller scales. If you mill 100,000 tons of wheat, you'll produce 20,000 tons of bran. That will produce that amount of dietary fibers. You've upscaled the value by, because dietary fibers are uh, uh, an ingredient people want in their food and in their ingredients. So that's probably going to be more valuable than the original 100,000 tons of wheat. But it's a byproduct. Similarly, high protein powders. The demand for plant protein is going through the roof at the moment, and you can either use it for going into ingredients or use it to functionalize. And it's work that um, people at Harry Watt here, like Steve Houston and uh, Lydia Campbell do. So looking at what was a waste, we need to change that mentality completely. Right, new BN now. Right, so we need to grow more, right? If it's sustainable, I'm thinking more about crops, but the land's going to change. We've got climate change coming in, we've got the predictions. That's what we are currently, and this is soil classes, roughly. So anything that's yellow will grow any range of crops. That's what we want, yellow ones. 2050, that's looking pretty sweet, I would say. Scotland's going to expand up. If the temperature goes up, we may be thinking of maybe pineapples, maybe a step too far. However, the climate's changing. So although we can grow in more places, the risk for drought and extreme weather is also going up as well. So we have to be able to manage not just new land, but it's the new weather that goes hand in hand with it. So what are the barriers to this progress? Sustainability is there. It's within our grasp at the moment. Even if we just do the waste side, I think we'll win. But we can grow more. Um, we might be shifting to intensive crop. A lot of monocultures growing lots of cereals. And the, 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 the pull out of Europe without a trade deal is going to be interesting because we're going to have to grow a lot of stuff ourselves unless we get a trade deal. We're going to be in deep doo-doo, as my son quoted. He's a financial expert, obviously. You can tell by those terms. Um, we're going to have to play around with our crop management systems. If you've got more land, different types of land, the weather's going to be different. You can't continually grow on soils without killing the soil. So we, there's a lot of things to be done. Um, and of course, there's a global inter interdependencies. There's no point in us growing lots and lots of cereals if it turns out Latvia is going to give it to us at half the price it takes us to grow it. So th that game has to be played with. However, if your process beats all of the above and is cheaper than synthetic, you're going to win. You will definitely win. Regardless of what people say, oh, I would very much have something that's um, natural, but they're never, ever prepared to pay for it. Retail markets tell you that. Very, that market is always small. So if the climate changes and you lose some of these, you'll lose the feedstock you're going to lose. However, we're getting forward for that. So basically today, I've talked about this. There's the whole other side on the machine side that's also doing something similar. So hopefully I've given you a feel for moving into sustainability. Thanks for listening.